to their futures Soldiers speak out 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 Welcome to the Veterans for Peace Hour. Our monthly programs are shown on Channel 22 in Thurston County at 5 p.m. on Wednesdays just after Democracy Now! 5 p.m. and also on Fridays at 9 p.m. And I want to thank Thurston Community Television who make it possible for us to come to you each month. We have a real treasure in TCTV that many communities do not have. This month, our program is on what veterans need to know on how to file VA claims. You see, one of our organizing principles of VFP is to seek justice for veterans. Our guests this show are James Brightman, an Iraq combat, combat medic, and his wife, Molly. And our very special guest, Lena Swanson, who is a retired benefits specialist, a veterans benefit specialist, who now teaches um, others how to become veterans advocates. Welcome, Lena, Jim, and Molly. Veterans are entitled to compensation for disability incurred or aggravated during their military service. And compensation rates can vary from $115 a month up to $2,471 a month. And the Veterans Administration estimates there are almost 24 million veterans as of at least 2007. Our training program to prepare Veterans Advocates is starting Tuesday uh, at Coffee Strong in Lakewood. That's off of uh, uh, Union Avenue, off of Exit 122. It'll be Tuesday at uh, 2.30 to 5.30. And Lena and myself will uh, co-lead together training programs. Uh, we want to be able to train people to be advocates for veterans. And that's why we have one veteran with us today and his wife. Um, Lena, what disabilities are compensable? Well, when you, when you, uh, a service-connected disability, as you said, is any physical or mental condition incurred while on active duty or aggravated by active duty that may have lasting effects. What am I talking about? It could be an automobile accident on your way to, uh, while you're on active duty, on your way to work or coming home from work. It could have hurt your leg playing basketball uh, or been hit by an IED uh, over in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan uh, full of shrapnel. Uh, what are they compensable? It could, be, it could be high blood pressure. It could be diabetes. It could be... Uh, any a limited range of motion on a joint that you've hurt on active duty. Um, the rules are changing daily. What's true today may not be true tomorrow. You see in front of me the two manuals, the federal laws and regulations, and it's the 2009 edition. They, they're in between those sheets, those, those covers are the the various uh, percentages of disability that uh, are rated. Uh, like post-traumatic stress disorder can be rated at 0%, it can be rated at 10%, 30%, 50%, 70%, or 100. 
uh, a range of motion problem can be you could have a, a a bruised leg and you but you you have trouble moving it that's that's ten percent by itself they so they the compens the com what do you call it the compensable compensable could be almost for any condition that ringing in your ears, that noise in your ears that's caused from acoustic trauma, now that, it does not have to be constant, it doesn't have to be in both ears, but, but reoccurring. And that's 10% by itself, that's at $115 a month, it's called tinnitus. Um, and if your job description puts you like in the uh, machinist mate in the bottom of a ship, or you're working on one of the tankers, or you're working on one of those uh, uh, you were around it, those 50 calibers, anything where that loud noise was, it's going to, it could set you up. A lot of the guys never filed for it because all the men's ears were ringing. They thought it was normal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's a good start, and we'll, we'll go on from there. Um, Jim, we've had the opportunity to um, know a little bit about you from your membership with Veterans for Peace, but for our listening audience... Um, tell them a little bit about your experience as a combat medic in Iraq, and then that led to you filing for some claims. But as we've talked a little bit, we've, um, we've learned quite a little bit more that would be helpful. And that also led to having Molly join us so that we could get a fuller picture. Um, as Lena shares, we need to get a full picture of the veteran from head to toe. And... Uh, Sometimes that toe is better known from the wife's perspective <laughs> than maybe the veteran. So, Jim, would you share a little bit about your experience? You've had 16-some years of experience in the service and now are receiving some VA medical uh, benefits. But tell us a little bit about your experience and why that led for you filing in the first place. All right. Um yeah, I had 14 years service. I did 14 months tour in Iraq um, as a combat medic. Um, it wasn't it wasn't an easy tour. That that's for sure. Um, uh, it's okay. Uh, Can I hold your hand? Um, so yeah, I, I did 14 months there as a medic. I saw a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, disaster. Um, uh, I, I not only witnessed it, but you know, I was certainly involved in, you know, uh, a lot of blasts. Roadside bombs, uh, you know, traumatic events, I guess. Um, uh, so, like, I came back from that uh, with a body that was definitely beat up. Um, to me, like, it was more, uh, more mentally, like, I, I knew that I wasn't... I wasn't the same. I, I viewed things different, and uh, when I came back, like I basically shut myself up in my house and didn't I had no interest in in the outside world at that point. And I did that for months, um, and it took friends to eventually get me back out and you know integrating, I guess, with society and. Uh, and yeah, so then I went to the VA. And that was in? Minneapolis. Minneapolis mm -hmm. VA, okay. The Minneapolis VA, Minnesota. And you sensed something was wrong and you wanted to get some redress yeah. for that. Yeah, um, as a medic, like, yeah, I just, I, I kind of knew a little bit, um, certainly not a lot, but I knew that, that I, I felt like I was owed something for uh, some of the problems that I was having. What kind of problems were you having that you at least diagnosed yourself or Molly helped you to diagnose? Uh, well, certainly um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, that was the top one. Uh, I mean, that was, it, it was, 
Yeah, it was really tough times at that point. Um, but Jim, go ahead, Molly. Jim was not functioning as a whole person. Um, when I met him, because I met him after he came back from mm -hmm. Iraq, um, I blame myself for him being able to come out of the house because we met and fell in love, and the drugs that he was on, um, prescribed by the VA, and the talk therapy that they prescribed was not helping him. I didn't feel like he was being heard, and I feel like he also didn't feel like he was being heard. Um, Jim couldn't go out to big crowds of people. He had to have his back to the wall. If a balloon popped at a, my birthday party, he, that set him off. he had to leave. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I, I loved him, but I definitely recognized him as not a whole person, and um, the VA did not help. Him did Jim recognize um, some of the problems he was going through, or did he try to deny some? Um, I would say that he he's one to play it down. He's not one to complain. Mm -hmm. It's not that I wouldn't call him a macho man, but I definitely wouldn't call him somebody that whines all the time. I, he's not going to talk to the VA about how um, cigarettes and coffee were his crutch over in Iraq and that he couldn't leave the house and that he had, you know, he just sat in front of a TV and, uh, you know, just thirst himself without asking for help. Now, Jim, first of all, I want to say welcome back and we want to welcome you back all the way. And that is one of the reasons that uh, this program uh, is on tonight is so that we can create more veterans advocates that will help veterans, especially you, Jim, but others as well. You also experienced some physical challenges as a result of uh, your service in Iraq. Would you tell us about those? Like physical injuries? or Yeah, just the injuries physical? that you received. So, yeah, the, the injuries, um, uh, I guess physical injuries, uh, uh, I have a blown eardrum. Um, and lost, that was a result of uh, various blasts, roadside bombs that I was I was you know exposed to um, both in you know foot patrols and uh, mounted vehicle patrols. Um, yeah, I was involved in several IED roadside bombs. Um, so that affected your ear, but you've had other damages yeah, as well. I, yeah, I I have. Um, I have several joint problems. Um, as a medic, you, you really have to carry a load. I mean, I'm an, I was an infantry person carrying a basic infantry load on top of um, a full medical load as well. So, how much would you say those weighed? Uh, my medical pack alone was 70 pounds. And how much was your uh, basic load? Um, well, I, including my vest. I actually weighed myself when I was over there. Um, <laughs> my vest, my my body armor, the ammo, uh, basic issue ammo, my M4, my 9mm, um, everything that I carried, weapons, gear, everything, added an extra 150 pounds to me. 150 pounds. Yeah, so almost my body weight. And, yeah, when we were on foot patrols, I carried that, and a, a lot of our our patrols were dismounted foot patrols, so... We were scaling walls up and over walls up on top of rooftops. You know, I, I was banging myself up. Uh, knees, I have, I have terrible knees. Uh, I have uh, uh, torn rotator cuff. Yeah, torn rotator cuff. Um, and uh, I, I, I continuously have back issues. Um, but you also had some problems where yeah. you had to have surgery in, I, the, in the mouth. The, the I had, um, yeah, a uh, facial injury. Um, that was due to a blast? That, that was due to a target. Actually, it was during target practice. A uh, target blew into my face and, and took out my upper three teeth and uh, serrated my upper lip. Um, so they did plastic surgery on my upper lip um, and put dental implants for my teeth. Um, and now I don't have any feeling, I guess, in mm -hmm. two-thirds of my upper lip, basically the area that was serrated. And, um, yeah, and then there was just other 
uh, minor thing I I do have tinnitus. I have a, it's almost a constant ringing. Constant ringing. Um, on top of the blown eardrum. Um, uh, yeah, and then I think we had talked about I had a I had a spot that was unknown to the VA at the time. They they couldn't identify what it was. Some a sort skin of lesion. Lesion. Yeah, skin, skin lesion. Skin problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now um, you were inside a armored carrier at one time, or something yeah. where the one in front of you blew up, or so. Yeah, I've, um, I was definitely in APCs, um, the armored personnel carriers over there. Um, most of our, um, and I was in Bradley's as well. Most of our, our mounted patrols were done done in Humvees, though, um, up armored Humvees, um, and um, the IED blast that I was exposed to myself was in Humvees. I was a, certainly a medic on scene for um, Bradley's getting hit where I was exposed to, you know, what I, I feel to this day is toxic, um, some sort of toxic smoke and, um, from these vehicles, Humvees, Bradley's, uh, being burned and me of course having the, to be there and, and treat people um, being exposed to those conditions. I feel like I have lung, you know, problems to this day. Um, as a result, um, you know, chronic cough and, uh, yeah, so. And you were in Minneapolis at the time, so you went to the Veterans Administration. Tell me about that, because as I understand, you did it pretty much on your own at the I time. I did. I did do it on my own. Um, uh, I, uh, I did some sort of, like, survey as we were getting, I don't know, uh, exit interview or something like that. Uh, the Army does an exit interview and kind of establishes kind of their own uh, baseline. And um, I, I, yeah, was discharged. And then I went to the Minneapolis VA on my own and um, I was screened. Um, they went through, uh, basically, I didn't have a lot of medical records from my deployment in Iraq, which is what I feel really hung me up. Um, I was I was serving in a very remote area in Iraq. Um, there was myself and another medic um, assigned to this. It was a patrol base, so it was a forward operating. I mean, it wasn't like your normal like bases over there. Um, it was basically we occupied a building. We, when we got in country, we we um, swept a building. Um, that was large enough to fit an infantry company in, which was 150 guys. This was an old casino hotel. Um, we swept the building, and we occupied that building. And I was in that building for my 14 months. So I wasn't on a larger base with medical facilities, you know, the, the typical large base that you hear of in Iraq. Um, I lived in the city amongst the people. We were very remote. Our, our nearest larger base was typically like an airlift. Um, and so, yeah, when I sustained injuries, or, or um, like when the guys that I treated sustained injuries, um, if they didn't need to be evacuated, myself being one of two medics, like we wrote up the reports. And so, like if I was injured, if I myself was injured or sick, something, um, either my medic partner um, uh, wrote something up, put it in my file, or I wrote something up myself because. He wasn't always around. I wasn't. All, I mean, because there was rotating patrols, infantry patrols, continuously. Mm -hmm. You know, 150 infantry guys. You know, they sent out a couple squads continuously. You know, they come back, rotate. Every patrol had to have a medic. One medic had to stay at the patrol base in case if there was something that hit the patrol base, um, or somebody got sick or whatever at the patrol base, and then the, the other medic accompanied. So we would rotate out. So it wasn't always. Easy access, you know, even getting my medic partner to write something up. So I document a lot of things, and I guess to make short story, I mean, long story short, is um, that held me up when I went to the VA. Like, um, uh, I feel like they didn't take my word for it, like, um, because I didn't have a physician or a physician's assistant, somebody other than a medic um, documenting my, my, my cases that I was trying to... We'll forward. learn some things. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask Lena in a, in a second just um, to share a little bit. As a matter of fact, now would be a good time. Lena, you've heard Jim share 
some of the things that he's experienced and some of the things that Molly's experienced. What would you have the class, which is going to be offered at Coffee Strong on Tuesdays, mm -hmm. uh, be able to ask Jim to draw him out so that they could help him make claims that would get heard and um, he would be awarded the type of compensation that he should have? What kind of things would you suggest that either I or anyone else in the class would ask Jim? Well, as a technical advisor, yes, uh, he mentioned coughing. He mentioned, and you know, in the, the smoke and the inhalation of the sand. I mean, they—it was sandy over there, right? Yeah, that's over from sandstorms all the time. And and the, we don't know what what kind of uh, bacteria was in that sand either. Mm -hmm. What kind of damage it could have done to his lungs? I don't know if they X-rayed his lungs or not. But if I were uh, going to be interviewing this man. I would I would start with that noise in his ears. I would start with questioning him. Does he does he have headaches? You so know? that literally starting from the head to the toes, as yeah. you were mentioning. Absolutely. When you yeah. get done, when the student gets done with him, he feels he should feel like he's been put through a sieve. <laughs> but did you get a Purple Heart? No. Okay. Did you apply for one? No. Okay. Uh, in any event, what 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 bothered me was the VA challenging him on his uh, statements that he made but when he and this other medic And there's some regulations that really talk to yes. that. Yeah. The, uh, the federal laws, uh, federal veterans laws, rules and regulation, two, 2009 edition, and there has not been a, uh, a new one put out yet. Uh, but it's uh, Title 38 United States Code 1154, and it's on page uh, 46. It's about the combat vet, and this is what this is distressing. Mm -hmm. It said, in the case of any veteran who engaged in combat with the enemy in active service with the military, naval, or air organization of the United States during a period of war, campaign, or expedition, the secretary shall accept as sufficient proof of service connection any disease or injury alleged to have been incurred in or aggravated by such service uh, and satisfactory lay or other evidence as service uh, incurrence or aggravation of such injury or disease. If consistent with the circumstances, conditions, or hardships of such service, notwithstanding the fact there was no official documentation. So, so in this case, Jim doesn't have the official documentation for some of those it. maladies he has. Didn't need it. Did he doesn't need it. it. No, no. And uh, the... Uh, the difference between that, it's a service connection of such injury or disease may be rebutted by clear and convincing evidence to the contrary. That is, uh, preponderance of the evidence is 50.1. Clear and convincing evidence, if they wanted to controvert anything he said, it has to be almost 90% by the VA, if the VA wanted to come back and contest it. So they should have taken your word. They should have welcomed you home. They should have thanked you for your service. Uh, and immediately offered you uh, counseling services. I understand you got some of it. Mm -hmm. One of the things I would like to share with you is here in the state of Washington, as I mentioned earlier, the, they, we have strategic locations throughout the state of Washington, PTSD counselors available at your service that you don't have to pay for. The state of Washington taxpayers pay for it. We were the uh, the state of Washington was the lead in getting that started. Mm. And I encourage you to, uh, to seek those people out. Now, he mentioned ringing in the ears. Yes, it's called tinnitus. It's, it's a condition caused by acoustic trauma, the fact that they blew out his eardrum. Uh, and it, it doesn't have to be constant. It doesn't have to be in both ears, but it has to be reoccurring in one or both ears. And that's 10%. And Jim, you get 10% for that? I don't believe so. No. Okay. The uh, the the other students would be should be asking him about his joint pain, because if he was uh, if he was in a blast, if he was in these uh, hummers, is that what you yeah, call them? Hum base. Mm -hmm. And they were they were involved in in blasts. Mm -hmm. Yes. You got bumped around, right? Oh yes. Okay. The the fact of the matter is that that joints have a tendency to develop arthritis. 
if they've been injured. Am I correct? Yes. Now, Jim's a young man, and he may not have that arthritis now, but as a result of that injury that was aggravated due to the blast, he would then... Well, what I would tell the students is that they should set him down and take his statement. You know, when, what, where, when, and what happened, where he was stationed, what he was doing when this happened. Because I go on, the, the VA cannot read his mind. Yes. And the more complete the statement is, the, the better it's going to be. Now, if, he does, if the x-rays do not show arthritis, but you, you indicated you have aching back and, mm -hmm. and uh, joints, knees, yes. you've got bad knees. Bad knees. I'll bet you nickel that it's going to show up some arthritis. How old bad are you? Bad fingers, 34. Okay, so the, the, the students should be asking them, you know, from his top to his bottom. Uh, and the, somebody should be interviewing the wife as to his mood swings, his sleeping patterns, his, his uh, uh, temperament. Well, let me give you an example. Molly, what have you observed with Jim? And I know this may be embarrassing to Jim, but this is just an example. And, and I told Jim before, and, and Jim, um, I've known you for several years, and this is probably the most that you've opened up in, in all those years. Um, and this really helps all your fellow vets that are out there that haven't got the compensation like you. Um, to learn how to go about getting that compensation. Uh, comp compensation. Mm -hmm. Molly, what have you observed on some of his uh, other medical things? You, we mentioned ear, we mentioned PTSD. Mm -hmm. What type of things have, have you noted? I think what I'm most sensitive to is his issues with PTSD. Um, his sleeping patterns are off the charts. Um, he wakes up and thinks he's back over there. And um, it's really helped to have a puppy in our life recently because that has added some calm to his life mm -hmm. because um, this animal has really reached him in a way that even I can't calm him down. And you're night. actually good at calming because I know you're a massage therapist <laughs> <laughs> and Jim can benefit from yes. that. Yes, I'm yeah. always working on that shoulder. It's always being re-aggravated. I can't fix it because it's been torn. It's not going to fix itself through massage. So there's a torn rotator cuff. Kind yes. Of thing. It's going to yes. require surgery, and he's young enough that the, the danger in, in not getting it taken care of is what's atrophy mean? Muscles yeah. loose. It, it, it's the muscle is going to dry up, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. if you don't get it taken care of. Is that service connected? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, that's a zero? Uh, yes. It, yeah, oh. it wasn't even... Okay. Recognized. Wasn't even recognized. No. So Jim has woken up with me moving in bed and thinking that I am um, somebody, you know, attacking him. And so he has reacted defensively. Um, so it, although I, I know it's not him, I know it's his, his history. But he, yeah, he definitely wakes up in Iraq, even though he's in bed in America. Well, that's one of the reasons I said welcome home, and we want to welcome him home all the way. Mm -hmm. The uh, does he has he complained to you about his back and his his knees? See, those are things I work that are him important. almost every okay. week, massage wise. It's important though that you get those those notes down. Mm -hmm. uh, what other things did you hear Jim speaking to briefly? As well, as he basically. says he's thirty percent rated. That, mm -hmm. that he's. At only 10% for post-traumatic stress. Yes. That, that distressed me, especially listening to them talk. Uh, if I were a counselor, and I'm, I am not accredited by the VA anymore, and I am not authorized to represent veterans, and I'm no. just John Q. Citizen, but what I would ask the students that suggest to them that they reopen his claim immediately on, on the delayed stress because the condition is very severe. I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. The other, what I heard him talking about, he's going to college. You're going to Evergreen State College, right? Yes. And you're 30% rated. Yes. And you paid your own tuition, plus you got student loans. Right. And the, the GI Bill. The Montgomery GI yeah. Bill. Well, as a 30% rated veteran, he is entitled to apply for vocational rehabilitation. That, that educational program would pay his tuition, would buy his books, buy him any special equipment he needed, 
So this, it distresses me that, that, that this has not been discovered. And I recommend you immediately, uh, uh, Dennis, help him, uh, uh, get him in touch with. Now, there should be a, veteran spe a veteran's advisor on the grounds of Evergreen, but I would go even beyond that. I would uh, make application. I think it is uh, it's a VA form for voc rehab. You can fill it out. I, I can't call it offhand, mm -hmm. but uh, call the... the Call the 800 number and ask them to send you a, 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 a an application for voc rehab. They very well might, uh, when they approve it, which they should, uh, they'll pick up. Like I said, all of the, all of your education. I can't believe this happened. Right. We're hearing that more and more, Lena, um, in classes. We come across people. I remember one young lady saying that she had educational benefits to remember the, that yes, student yes. Who, uh, who said that her father passed away due to, I believe, cancer or some other type of thing, but um, she received education benefits, and you asked a very astute question. Is your mother still receiving benefits? And they said, no. 30 years without benefits, and she was eligible as a spouse. Right, and I turned her over to a gentleman in the class who was visiting the class, Mr. Maurice Sharp, who uh, is a former prisoner of war, and he connected her up with, with uh, a federal employee who is working on that case. But this is, is what I am... There's enough work out there for everybody. That's number one. Uh, it, the, the, the networking that Dennis and I are going to try to do is to educate the, the uh, people so that... They're not going to become, they're not advocates, they're going to become claims agents where they can independently represent the veteran. But we need to form a network and get that word out. Many of our widows, by the way, you know, when I said uh, the rules are constantly changing. What was true 20 years ago is not true today. What was not true 20 years ago is true today. The, uh, many of those widows very well may be, they very well may be, uh, those of you out in the TV community, if your husband passed away from uh, cancer, maybe he died of, uh, uh, he, he was a Vietnam vet, uh, she should apply immediately. Re she may have been initially denied, but the rules have changed. Uh, the Secretary of the VA, General Shinseki, has just changed the regulations, adding coronary artery disease, Parkinson's disease, and B-cell leukemia to the Agent Orange exposure. But there, there must be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of widows out there whose husbands passed away and they were initially denied and they do not know that they're entitled and they could reapply now. Uh, the same goes for, for uh, our veterans who were initially, I'm sorry, the same goes for our veterans who were initially raided by the VA and they haven't gone back, even though their condition has worsened. So those that were maybe zero percent, right? But their condition has worsened, right? And it was due to a service-related. Correct. Yeah. If they were rated at less than ten percent, that's the zero rating. Mm -hmm. uh, the government says they acknowledge the liability for that condition, but uh, it's not bad enough to warrant compensation at this point in so time. So it's liability without compensation. Liability without compensation. So ten years later, though. His condition has worsened. He's now on heart medication or whatever. Uh, maybe he's uh, uh, started out as a 0% diabetic, and now he's on insulin twice a day. Uh, important that he reopen his claim for increase because diabetes is going to affect everything in the body, by the way. It affects the heart. It affects the eyes. It affects the extremities, circulation. Yes. So it's important to keep close tabs on that. Well, matter of fact, Lena, uh uh, a veteran needs only to be in country one day. Step one foot. Step one foot in the country That's for correct. one day. That's right. And we're talking about 58,000 potential veterans who could be affected by now Agent Orange. 30 years it's taken for to get this recognized. That's correct. And uh, we're talking possibly $50 billion mm -hmm. uh, of what is going to cost to take care of the veterans 
due to Agent Orange. That's that's only part of it, by the way. I don't mm. know if you uh, there was a the National Veterans Legal Services. Yes. By the way, who who write this manual this every is, year? This is the one of two thousand some pages that we use, and it's the Veterans Benefit Manual. And it's it's the National Veterans Legal Services, and it's authored by uh, Ron Abrams, my mentor. He just recently filed a uh, a class action lawsuit. Uh, there were several thousand men who were discharged from Iraq and Afghanistan with di diagnosed as unfit for service, with post-traumatic stress, but not compensable. Uh, that's, that's against the rules. So the 4,300 veterans that were discharged mm -hmm. because of their PTSD right, and did not receive the 30% rating, correct? That's correct. And that's what the lawsuit is. Now the six that filed it, and they're asking for others to come in, we believe that there's probably some of you in the listening audience that your viewing audience that that's possibly happened to you it's it's very true very true and of the of the 4300 that they're talking about that's at that that's known i mean that they know of didn't mention uh, marine corps i think it mentioned primarily the army uh, but there any of those ground troops but uh, they're also coming out with this personality disorder thing and we need uh, the ad, the the claims agents need to review what personality disorder means and the diagnostic uh, the DSM three manual DSM four manual gives a perfect definition of that and the symptoms between personality disorder and post traumatic stress disorder are very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is if if a if a veteran makes it through boot camp. In other words, the boot camp is a discovery period. If they find anything wrong with you out there in the, uh, in the military, during that training period, they could bump you out of the service. You have nothing. But if you make it through boot camp and you go on through your training and you head out for the sea or Iraq or Afghanistan, and they turn around and want to say that you've got post-traumatic stress, dis I mean, uh, that personality disorder, I'd say, wait a minute, you know, if that were me, I would, I would if I were... Uh, service officer, I would look very hard at that. Now we're looking at 185,000 veterans potentially just in Vietnam and our our crew here at TCTV who uh, faithfully does the program every month mostly are Vietnam vets and we know other veterans that that is possibly what is affecting them. I have a close friend who said oh yes I was sprayed a number of times with Agent Orange when I was out on patrol and hasn't filed for it. It's, it, uh, they just don't know. Well, what do Vietnam veterans, and we're switching now, Jim and Molly, from Iraq and Afghanistan veterans to um, Vietnam era, Vietnam veterans. What do they need to know in order to file compensation or to get the help that they will need, particularly for some of the things that are going to affect them? Well, they need to see a they need to see a, a claims agent or one of the service organizations and go in. But the idea: the longer you wait to file a claim after discharge, the more difficult it is. There's a there's a 365 day presumptive period from the date of discharge. If you develop any if you're diagnosed with any chronic illness during that first 365 days, the government must assume it started on active duty, and there need not have been uh, official documentation. So that's where, you, when you say presumptive, the, the VA has to presume that's that correct. that happened during their that's term correct. of service. That's right. Now, the, but the, the longer you wait, after that 365 days, the more difficult it is to establish the service connection, except for the Agent Orange presumptives. Well, now, under um, 38 CFR uh, 330, there is a delayed direct service connection. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, delayed can be established uh, for an event in the service uh, caused um, to for that veteran to suffer disability or disease many years after that event happened in the service. Well, that, that it comes back to the coronary artery disease. It may not have shown up uh, in the Vietnam vet until 
the last few years. The World War II, the, the former prisoner of war from World War II, the presumptive conditions in there, some of it didn't show up until in their later years. They were in their 50s, 60s, or 70s. But the government had to assume that it began while they were a prisoner, which is considered combat conditions. The delay is, is, is the, the government's going to acknowledge it. You know, it took us years to get the radiation exposure from World War II recognized. I mean, what, 40 or 50 years to get that recognized. Uh, so sometimes it takes a long time. Well, and Agent Orange is over 30 now. Well, that's, uh, you know, the, there, were th well, there were three barrels of chemicals in Vietnam. One was white, one was blue, and one was orange. It had the orange stripes on them. The orange was uh, the dioxin, mm -hmm. the defoliant. Um, that's what they found on Love Canal in New York. We didn't know, our government did not realize what the damage we were doing to our young men in Vietnam. We truly didn't. Now my son, uh, my husband's son, flew helicopters in Vietnam and sprayed the chemicals. Uh, he has lung problems today, you know, but uh, he, won't, he won't file a claim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lena, tell us about some of the successes you had when you were an advocate or an agent uh, for these veterans. I know that you've talked to some that were prisoners of war and others that weren't. Um, you've uh, talked to a gentleman who's 93 years old who, thanks to you, gets quite a bit of tax-free compensation. G give us a little bit of success story so that we could encourage, encourage veterans like Jim. You know, sometimes it's a matter of principle. Many of our World War II vets, when they came home, had a very negative experience with the VA and didn't want to have anything to do with them. They just threw up their hands and, and moved away from it. Uh, the Wake Islanders, I don't know if you knew about the Wake Islanders or not, but that small island that the Japanese expected to take within about six hours, uh, they held out from December 7th until December the 24th assisted by these 1,200 civilian contractors who were there to build an airstrip for the Navy. Uh, they did not get veteran status until 1981. When I found them in Boise, Idaho, less than half of them had even applied for their, their uh, discharge papers. They weren't getting anything from the VA. Uh, I got them all rated at 100%. Uh, the... Uh, a case from Iowa, this man and his wife flew in to see me. They wanted me to take their case to court. He was a Korean veteran. I don't even know whether he was a POW or not. So I, I took his power of attorney as a national service officer for American ex-prisoners of war. I had his case transferred into Seattle, and it was that thick. And I went through it page by page by, it took me a week to go through it. And I tabbed all the places where I thought the VA had made a mistake over the years. Uh, as a result of what I found, I took it to a rating specialist there in Seattle. And I told him, I said, Dave, if I take this to court, this is what they want me to do. If I take it to the Court of Appeals for Veterans, I said, I'm going to spread the VA all over everywhere. And uh, he said, let me look at it. He came back a week later, and he said, you're right, Lena. He said, transfer the case in here permanently. We'll take care of it. So I did. And he got about $170,000 retroactive money and retroactive. Without, having, without having to go to, to court. Because the longer you, you have to be in the appeals process, the longer it's going to take for that veteran to get that money. And the idea is to get it, the, uh, idea is to get it resolved at the lowest possible level. The other thing, on, in training these, these uh, claims agents, teaching them how to com uh, complete a, uh, uh, a document with the veteran and how to, what supporting evidence is going to be necessary, uh, where to go get that evidence, uh, how to get an occupational uh, therapist uh, review of a veteran who may not be employable. Because on PTSD, almost every category, it talks about occupation and employability. Mm -hmm. So if necessary, if you're going to take on the feds, then you need to be prepared so you get all of the evidence you can. You take them to an occupational therapist, you take them to a voc rehab specialist, um, and get that paperwork 
on this man or that, that veteran who may not be uh, uh, able to perform. It, it's a good argument. It's, it's, it's a good presentation. So you get your case built when you're going in as though you're going to take it all the way to the U.S. Court of Appeals. The more evidence, the more complete it is, the smoother it's going to go through the system. Now, I just want to remind our uh, people watching today that there will be training opportunities that you can, not to be intimidated, <laughs> have an opportunity to go through 4,000 pages, Lena. Well, see, the difference between you and me is I've got mine tapped. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> I have my work ahead of me. And that helps a person like myself to be able to not miss some of the things that are compensable in the veterans that are out there. And we have veterans watching on Channel 22 now that we know you're out there and you have a right to be compensated for that. And this training class uh, will be at Coffee Strong, which is on air exit 122 off of Highway uh, 5, and it will be on Tuesdays at 2.30. And so the two of us will be there going through these 4,000 pages and case studies and other things, and uh, we'll be able to um, talk to people like Jim and Molly and different friends that he's had that he knows have been affected. Jim, as you have heard us talk a little bit, what comes to mind? What is going on? What are you thinking about? What would you like us to even be able to research and address? What has sort of hit you between the eyes? Well, I guess um, I feel like me personally, I feel after talking to you guys and hearing more and and even a little bit before I came in as well tonight, like I, I feel like I haven't um, been given everything that I've deserved for the stuff that I've had to go through. And, and Molly, what have you heard tonight that you would, long after we left, you'd say, hey, Jim, we've got to talk. What, what type of things, are you encouraged more by what you've heard tonight? Yes, I, well, I appreciate Lena telling me to take notes because I have half a page already of things that we have never thought about bringing forth. We, we, I definitely wanted to drag him to the VA to talk about um, PTSD, but um, there's plenty of other physical conditions that we haven't talked about. Tinnitus never thought of it. And I know that that's something that he deals with. So um, the big thing for me is that I can't believe I haven't been writing or making him write this all down before and have waited this long. Because, yeah, well, he's uh, a, thinking he's about a... the timeline of the longer it's been, it hasn't been that fa long since he's been out, but it's getting longer every day. And it needs to be addressed now because we're limping along financially and we shouldn't be having to limp along for something that he did for his country. You know, I, the, the, the caution that I, that I, that I want to, to give to the audience is that when you go in to see a service officer, uh, look around the room for their reference material. Now, these days you can find it online, that's true. But I always, what if the computer's down? See, I always had my reference material. I've got a Merck manual. I've got the DSM-4 manual. I've got the Cecil's medical text books, two of them. Then I've got the VA laws and regulations, the most up-to-date ones they have. I don't, uh, and it's important when, uh, when in this training, and if we encourage you to attend, is that the more material uh, that you have to research, I mean, the, the, the better it is for you. They know those rules, know they learn the rules, pay attention to what's going on, uh, listen to the radio, listen to the TV, read the, read the articles in the paper regarding veterans issues because they're constantly changing. But your, your advocate is only as good as the information they have uh, available to them. Uh, so I say research it. And quote the law if you have to. Quote the regulation if you have to. Uh, and to this young man, 
I say, thank you for serving our country. Yes. There's, uh, there's some things that we can't give you back. We can't give you back your youth. We can't give you back your idealism. We can't give you back your, the, what you saw. We can't erase your mind. But we can prove to you that we truly care about you. And there's a man named Tom Schumacher with the State of Washington Department of Veterans Affairs. He's available to you. Uh, he will see that you get someone that, that you can sit down and talk with because it's important. They told me early on it's important that you get this stuff cleaned out of your system. And let the healing process begin. But know that we as a country, and we here in this audience, we, we truly are grateful for what you have done. Well, I really want to thank you, Lena, for um, being part of the discussion tonight and also um, helping to train uh, tomorrow's uh, people who will <coughs> be the best advocates uh, for veterans like Jim and ultimately um, benefiting their spouses like Molly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's sad commentary that uh, we have situations that create veterans that have these needs. And it is a goal of Veterans for Peace that we will work towards peace that will resolve all these things that lead to such a cost in war. And when we talk about a cost in war, we often think about loss of life. But there's more than that. There's, there's that loss of one's self for having experienced the horrors of war. And I'm sorry that uh, my colleague, Jim, had to experience that, though he was in a life-saving role and had to work his best to save not only the lives of veterans but uh, of Iraq citizens. And um, I know he lives with that day and night. And we trust that the programs that uh, we will be able to make available uh, for Jim and the other Jims in the world will be able to help him progress in such a way that uh, he truly comes home all the way. I want to thank our viewing audience tonight as we've listened to what it takes to file for veterans compensation with the Veterans Administration. Uh, this program is viewed on Channel 22 on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. and also on Fridays at 9 p.m. We also meet the third Sunday of the month at Traditions Cafe in Olympia. And uh, we also have a program on radio station KAOS on the um, third um, Thursday of the month. And I know, Lena, that you were uh, a guest there um, very recently. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you for coming. And uh, Jim, thank you for being as open as you possibly could be. Um, I will say that this was probably a good experience for you uh, to share that, and it'll be a good experience as you share with your spouse uh, and leaving some of the things that you heard. Thank you, too, for your service as well. Thank you for our viewing audience as well, and we again appreciate the auspices of Thurston Community Television, who make it possible for us to come to you with a Veterans for Peace Hour every month. Thank you. To their future.